Hello and welcome to the YVS episode of Alexis on Fire. These guys started off as a straight out of high school Canadian group and they hit it big with their debut album. Quite the achievement. If you're not familiar with the band, then you may be aware of Dallas Green, who is the man behind City and Colour. This is where it started for Dallas. He plays guitar and does the clean vocals for the group. And for many, he is one of the standouts in this genre. Let's get right into it then. So, in 2002, they released their self-titled album. As you can see, the colours and the ratings are really, really solid. You'll even notice that there's no red colour on any of the tracks, which means that I don't skip any of them. So therefore, this album is vinyl worthy. Woo! The details about the vinyl record will be on a separate video that I'll be releasing alongside this one. The reason why I'm splitting them up with this new format is because I understand that it's a very niche thing to collect and listen to vinyl, and it's more for the general listener when it comes to these reviews. You don't have to be interested in vinyl, really. Everything I do is trial and error, and we're working through it as we go along. Everything may change in the future when it comes to the way we brand things here, but this is how we're doing it today. Now, I understand that some people may be thinking, oh, well, of course you love the debut album because it's all nostalgic and all that. Well, here's the thing, because I didn't discover this album until quite later on after I had been exposed to some of their other tracks, which then got me interested in listening to them some more. I believe I was around about 20 or 21 years old when I really started to listen through to this album, and I gotta say, I was really stunned at the quality of this. It's an absolute barrage of an album. Some would even say it's their heaviest album. And that's the thing, I'm not really into the entire heavy music thing. Maybe when I was younger I used to think I was, but now I'm a lot more honest with myself and I just, I'm not. It's not really something which I seek out really that much either. But still, this album just I can't not love it. It's so, so good. When we see their opening three tracks, 44 Caliber Love Letter, Counterparts and Number Them, Adelida, these are all pillars for me. That means that these are the top of the top, the creme de la creme of music, people. This is as good as it gets. And they have no right to be this good. They were what, 17, 18 years old, and they were at the pinnacle of their genre. Like, I'm serious, this is perhaps one of the best, most consistent albums you will find that fits into this heavy music category for me. Like, I'm looking now at A Dagger Through the Heart of St. Angelus, and I gave it a keeper in green, and listening back to it again just now, I don't know why I didn't put it as purple, because it's a fucking pillar, people. It's incredible! George Petit on vocals on this album is almost unmatched. There's very few cases of vocalists coming close to how much I love of this. Be it his screams or the spoken word sections he does, I mean, I don't really care for what is being said. It's not something I focus on in music all that much unless it really is the you know, what stands out in music, let's say, you know, if you're listening to Bob Dylan, then yeah, the lyrics of what are really going to make it stand out. But in this, let's be real, uh, you're not really listening to the lyrics all that much. Although it does help that if they're not extremely cringy, but even if they were, I mean, the delivery of it in the musical context of this, I wouldn't care. Then we move on to Water Wings, which, in the middle of the album is one of the standouts of the album. Oh, you just want to fucking go crazy when you hear this. Like, focus in on Dallas and his vocals throughout this. It is peak Dallas. I would say that track seven, where no one knows, is the weakest track on the album. Looking at number eight, The Kennedy Curse, I would say that The Kennedy Curse is close to being green. However, you know, it, it, that's sort of the category of potential grower is for, you know, it can grow to be a green. And I would say that looking back on it now, it has grown to be a green. So while there is a little bit of a lull here in the album, it's not 
on the degree to which I skip it. So it does remain vinyl worthy at this point. So Jabella is very characteristic of the album and the band as a whole at this point. I believe they've been described as what the main cover represents on the album, where it's like two Catholic girls who are on the playground having a knife fight. And I think it's such a brilliant, brilliant description of the band and what they sound like. At around 1 minute and 15 seconds of this track, there's this call and response with the guitar, and to me, it's almost like poking jabs with the knife <laughs> into someone. That's that's kind of how I interpret that. I don't know. It's just something that I felt. I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone else. Track 10 is kind of a ballad, if you could call it that. It's solid. So if they cut off the album at track 10, then at this point, it's still technically vinyl worthy. Okay, it's... A bit weaker on the second side compared to the first six tracks if they were to end it on track 10. So you would be probably thinking, well, if only like the second side was as good. But then just when you thought you heard all that you had to hear off this album, they give you pulmonary archery. And they just remind you why they're a cut above the rest. This is how you end an album on a high. So I have yet to mention something quite important. There are kind of two different versions to this album. There is the remaster and then there is the original mastering. But here's the thing, mastering in most cases is no biggie. It's just something that sounds a little bit louder in places and you can hear minor differences between a remaster and something that hasn't been remastered. For some reason, someone was allowed to get away with remastering this album and giving it almost what seems like a totally different mix as well. It goes so far beyond what remastering is typically about, and I hate it. I sought out the original mastering of this album when I bought it on vinyl for myself, as you'll see in the other video if you check that out, and there are some key differences in the mix where, I mean, the most obvious case is when they cut off the piano outro to Adelida. What were they thinking there? And just in general, I find on a personal level of taste that I just prefer the original in every way. All right, so moving on to their next album, which was released around about two years after, and this is Watch Out. Well, you'll see that there's a lot of difference here, in my ratings anyways. There's just something missing here doesn't have the charm that the debut has in the songs themselves, it seems. The energy is kind of there, but at the same time, the songs are just not of the same calibre, it seems. Track 6, No Transitory, is a pillar, it has to be said. It's one of the best that they have done after the first album, and it would fit comfortably in anyone's catalogue, I would say, of this genre. It needs to be celebrated for what it is. And it was one of the first songs that I heard of them as well. And then again, with track 11, just like Pulmonary Archery, just when you think that you've heard it all, they hit you with an incredible closer. Happiness by the Kilowatt is more of a ballad of an ending, I guess you could say. A bit slower in tempo, a more traditional album closer, but nonetheless, it has all of what you would hope for from the band and it's a standout in their discography without a doubt pillar 100 percent. i do like to focus in on what i do like and unfortunately i just don't really have a lot to say about what i don't this isn't really like a bad album just because i only like two of the songs on it does not make it bad by the way it's just that they're not memorable. I must have tried this album about three, four times now, and still the only two tracks I find that I keep coming back to are No Transitory and Happiness by the Kilowatt. So moving on. Okay, so 2005, the Switcheroo series, which is Alexis on Fire covering Monin songs, and then vice versa in Monin covering Alexis on Fire songs. And this is an EP. I don't know why I've put album review. I am not changing that now. Sorry too late. Anyways, the only track I keep here is the first track, Passing Out in America. 
I have heard Monin's version of it, and yeah, yeah, I like it. I do. However, Alexis just do it better. It's one of my favorite Alexis songs, to be fair, actually. I always have time to listen to this track. I can't help but sing along to the gang vocals in this one. And big credit to Monin for writing this track, because although Alexis do it better, in my opinion, credit always has to go to the people who write it. Okay, 2006, Crisis. And it's a little bit more balanced, as you can see. Sticking with the Keepers, we are on to track two. This could be anywhere in the world. And I do believe this was the first song that I heard from them. I don't tend to listen to this one as much as I have heard it a lot growing up. And if there's going to be an Alexis song that is you're most likely to hear, then it probably is going to be this one. So I tend to avoid it because of overexposure. I think by this point you can tell that the band are just sounding different quite a lot to the first album at this point. When we get onto Boiled Frogs, track four, I like the track, but then in terms of just the structure of the song and the woes and all that that goes on in it, you just wouldn't get that in the first album, and I prefer that about the first album. I've never really been into the whole whoa, whoa kind of stuff that you get in this kind of music. I I find it just quite cheap, really. With track 8, Crisis, it's good. I like the intensity of the guitar instrumentals especially. It really makes you think that you're in a crisis when you hear this. When I hear it, I think to myself, yep, that sounds like a crisis to me. To a Friend starts and finishes on what seems to be a chord that's played in reverse and the melodic line that Dallas has with this one, especially at the end where you get to hear him sing over it. It's the best part of the song, I would say, and everything in between is decent, but those are the standout moments. 2009, Old Crows, Young Cardinals. Again, this is a fairly balanced album in that there's a bit to keep and quite a bit to skip through. It's very close in style to Crisis. It has been a while since I originally made these graphics, and I gotta say, with track 4 born and raised, it probably could be a pillar for me, to be honest. It's one of those where, yeah, I kind of have heard it quite a bit, but even with the two different versions that I listen to on a fairly regular basis, I mean regular being like maybe, I don't know, once a year or something for me, (laughs) I don't really listen to the same music over and over much at all. But yeah, so if I can listen to something more than once a year, then I consider that to be quite regular. But yeah, like Born and Raised, it's a fucking great track. I do have a place in my heart for Midnight Regulations. It's not probably going to be a pillar, but it is always a trusty go-to for me off this album. And I guess the same goes for Accept Crime as well. And Burial, yeah, they're going for the traditional ballad, slower, quieter, closer. But it works. It's a good track. 2010, Dog's Blood, EP. I got no words for this. I don't like any of it. So I skip it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. 2010, they're going to Australia on tour. And they released a single on a 7-inch. And I've actually just this second only heard it for the first time. I don't know how it escaped me, but it did. This is the Dead Heart and I'm Stranded collection. Having just heard it, I gotta say, I wanna have it. And it's gone on my buy list. So I will be getting that as soon as possible if I can snatch a fair deal on it. I'm kind of contradicting myself where I was saying earlier that I don't like all of the whoa, whoa, woes and stuff. But in the dead heart, <laughs> Dallas does do 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 do. And I really like how it resolves at the end, actually, where they kind of give it a key change. I'm contradicting myself, I know, but <laughs> I can't help it. And then for I'm Stranded, it's a acoustic one, and I believe it's Wade on vocals, the lead guitarist in the band. It could be his first introduction to people on vocals for him as the lead vocalist, actually. Not too sure if I'm missing out on any other singles, possibly, but there is more of him to come. I mean that in regards to singing on lead vocals for Alexis, as he does have a couple of other bands where he is lead vocalist. One of these being 
Gallows, who seem to be of a British origin, it seems. However, Wade is in the band and he is lead vocalist. So I actually have a cool story about Wade in that I was having a tattoo done. He had on some City and Colour, the artist. Obviously, the conversation goes between City and Colour, then onto Alexis. And then he mentions how he was the artist for Wade and quite a few of his tattoos, I believe he said. So that's pretty cool. So if you're looking for some stripped down versions, acoustic and with Wade on vocals, then there's a EP for you. And that is 2012's Death Letter. As you can see, I have born and raised as a pillar. From the first moment I heard this, I loved it, even more so than the electric version. I do recommend that you actually, despite my rating saying that I skipped the rest of the songs off of the CP, that you do give them a try, because if the heaviness of Alexis are not for you, then maybe these acoustic versions will be. I think given how Born and Raised as a acoustic arrangement works just as beautifully well, in my opinion, even more beautifully than the electric version is a testament to how good of a song it is all overall for me. So by this point, the band are on hiatus. Indefinitely, I believe, at the time it was. They did a farewell show, and I believe that is what resulted in Live at Cops, which was released in 2016. If you like what you've been hearing so far from Alexis, and you are not put off live music, then I do recommend giving this one a shot as the songs that you do like, they give good performances on all of the tracks that are in my memory. So if you are looking for something that's good and live from the band, then you've got it and it's all right here. Many years later, in 2019 and then in 2020, the band had released three singles, Familiar Drugs, Complicit, Season of the Flood, and I gotta say, I was listening to these as they were getting released, and I wasn't impressed. I didn't feel compelled by them. So with that said, going into their next LP that was not long ago released in 2022, Otherness. It's a sea of red. There's nothing here that I find myself wanting to come back to, and there's nothing that I remember from the first and second time that I had listened to this. I'd say the most interesting part of the album is during track 6, Dark Knight of the Soul, and there is a synth instrumental which sounds like a cross between Journey's Separate Ways and then the Rasmus's Not Like the Other Girls. And it's an interesting blend. I think if you were to listen to all three examples, then you'd kind of get what I mean. And while we're on the topic of Separate Ways by Journey, I can't mention it and not refer you on to the music video for that song. It is one of the most hilarious music videos ever shot, in my opinion. It's classic 80s cheese. So that concludes the episode for Alexis on Fire. Remember, if you're a vinyl collector and you're interested in what I have to say about the quality of the pressing for their self-titled LP, it's the latest pressing, and I recommend you check out the video to know more about it. I hope you enjoyed the new format. And I will see you next time. Peace and love. Peace and love.